know about functional medicine, but I do know there are places where you can go on keto-friendly diets. And um, I think that's important because not only is the diet kind of individualized for the person, but the, the lab norms vary widely if you're following this way. Um, the other thing is, is that if you're going to practice keto medicine, you have to be willing to step outside the guidelines because the guidelines are crap. The well way, said. The way most <laughs> doctors are taught to treat thyroid disease or assess thyroid disease or look at your overall health is like very low standard. I mean, talk about, we talk about okay and then we talk about optimal. Standard medical practice is nowhere near optimal. Question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. About keto adaptation. Can I use the mic? Yes, that's yeah. great. I have a question about keto adaption. I uh, started keto in 2001, so that's 19 years. But I only do it for three months a year, and the other nine months I do regular low carb. I didn't the first year, that was my learning experience, I regained everything, but, but after that I do regular low carb. And so I'm on regular low carb right now, and I had a week when I've been eating a lot of sinful stuff, I'll confess, <laughs> um, things like crackers and occasional chocolate and so on. And I was testing my blood glucose, and by mistake I picked up a keto stick, I thought, damn, I've just wasted two bucks, um, because it's just gonna come out at zero. And it didn't, it came out at 0.7. So I wondered whether, whether if you become keto adaptive, whether you can last, if you just do it for three months, it lasts for the other nine, and if you can slip back into ketosis very quickly. Um, I mean, I've just eaten crackers for lunch, and this was the afternoon, and I was 0.7 ketosis, so I was very surprised. So I think it depends on the person, and it depends on the diet that you cycle back out into, since you're still low carb, and then given whatever your unique metabolic uh, current status is, you might still be in ketosis with a diet like that. If you uh, if you go back to eating the standard Western diet, you most assuredly will not be in ketosis. Yeah. Well, I think we say this a million times. Everybody's a little individual. But what has been shown with the evidence-based medicine, people follow low carb, and everybody has a different carb tolerance. The longer you do it, we do see people whose insulin sensitivity or gets better, or their carb intolerance, not so bad. So that does happen. Well, I guess just to throw a, a, a monkey into the, or, <laughs> throw it a wrench. A wrench into the, um, <laughs> a monkey wrench. wrench, into the wrench. <laughs> Spit it out. <laughs> what, what is ketosis? We really don't know what Being ketosis is. 0.5 BHB and above. Oh, 0.5 yes. and above? Well, that's the one that I use on the on the. Well, I know the books test. and I know the, yeah, the yeah, stylized yeah. picture yeah. where it, it, no, we don't really know. So that, that book um, was the best guess of Steve Finney and Jeff Volek where they have the, the here's what ketosis is and, and all that. It's like, but it's like early precincts in an election. <laughs> that now the more and more people we have doing it, they're actually going to be changing what the definition to be lower. That's expecting to be zero. You're expecting to, right. Well, so then the other thing, if um, you do any breath monitoring of the ketones, this is acetone uh, breath. Uh, it's different than beta hydroxybutyrate in the blood, different than urine acetoacetate. And they all kind of hang together. We've done a couple studies where the same person had all three done over the course of days. But uh, if you talk to Michel Lindell, for example, who created his own ketonics breath monitor because he has epilepsy and he wanted to be able to monitor it, exercise and other activities change the breath measurement. So, so alcohol, other, so, so acetone, beta hydroxybutyrate, beta hydroxybutyrate, BHB. Why even measure is what I have come to. Just keep the carbs low. Don't worry about the number because it will. You'll just have questions like this. <laughs> so. I just want to mention um, if you're doing urinary ketones, since you know buying all the sticks and pricking the fingers is a pain. But if you're doing urinary ketones, women just before their period will lose their ketones, 
And I used to always tell my patients, if you're doing that, don't do it before your period. Wait until a day or, toe or so into your flow. Um, and if, I remember a patient who was obsessive about measuring his ketones. And he would have, he would have variations all over the board, because you do. And he came in one day and said, boy, I went to a party last night, and I don't know how much I drank, but this morning I had the darkest ketones I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought he was burning fat. And it, was a, it, it actually would affect, alcohol will affect the ketone strips in the urine. So, yeah. <laughs> So, and he, he just thought that was a good way that he could drink a lot <laughs> So, there's a lot of variations. A lot of people get confused about all these numbers and which should I measure. And a lot of times we just tell our people, just do your diet. You can drive yourself a little, a little get a little neurotic with all these numbers. Yes. I don't recommend people track ketones of any type. Uh, occasionally, if they just swear, God, I'm doing it, I'll check their ketones at the clinic just to see. But, you know, to me, Ken said it very well the other day. This isn't about your weight. This is about fat loss, health, quality of life, getting off medicines. So uh, I don't care what your LDL is. If your blood pressure is better, you're losing fat, you're feeling better, you're sleeping better, your arthritis is better, and you've dropped four or five meds, I don't care what your ketones are. Question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you explain the difference between ketosis that we're striving for, ketoacidosis, which is a huge complication of some diabetics, and maybe the diabetic patient trying to maintain a ketotic uh, lifestyle? So what's the difference between ketosis, ketoacidosis, and then talk about a diabetic trying to say ketosis? most of the time. Yeah. You want to start? Okay. All right. So uh, we all know that being in ketosis is a very healthy therapeutic state. There's no danger from that. Uh, I used to take care of newly diagnosed type 1 diabetics in the, in the ICU at the Bonner Children's Hospital in Memphis during my training. And I never saw a single person in ketoacidosis who didn't also have a blood sugar that was off, off the meter. And almost always, they were also severely dehydrated. Uh, every single one of them had some sort of infection, from a bladder infection to pneumonia. Uh, I don't, I don't think, I've never seen an example of someone uh, putting themselves into ketoacidosis by eating a ketogenic diet, with the exception of one person who was taking one of the SGLT, SGLT uh, medications for type two diabetes. And I did know one example of that happening. But I don't think that was the diet. I think that was the medication. It's actually in the handout if you read it. So I don't think it's possible with a good whole food, real food, ketogenic diet to make yourself keto ketoacidotic. I don't think that's possible. And I hope every diabetic follows a ketogenic diet because nothing is going to lower their A1C and, and lower their triglycerides and raise their HDL. And that's exactly what they need. If I could just add the, knowing that you're a physician, um, the magnitude of ketosis is very different. So you check the blood, your beta hydroxybutyrate might be two or three, maybe five in nutritional ketosis. It'll go up to 10, 15, 20 on just as the number. Uh, and you buffer that, giving you, and you can't buffer, that's why you get acidosis. But now the, this new drug is a disaster. And this new drug class called SGLT2 inhibitors, it's the drug that makes you urinate out sugar. Not a good idea. I mean, you know, this is like uncontrolled diabetes. You're creating this. And so the feared complication is not ketoacidosis, although I've seen that. And the problem is if the pharmacologic ketoacidosis, there's now a new term, pharmacologic, because it's not the diet. Um, you have a normal blood glucose and you get ketoacidosis. So if someone's just checking the glucose, they'll, they'll think they're fine because traditionally you would always have hyperglycemia high blood glucose with the ketoacidosis. So, but the, the most feared complication is not ketoacidosis. It's because you have sugar in your urinary tract, you get infection, and you can get four years gangrene, which uh, is uh, not only just a terrible thing to have, it's basically your infection of your genitalia. You can die from it because it's very difficult to treat. 
And it's because you have basically the sugar marinating the growing bacteria there. It's, there are already class action lawsuits against the drug, which, but the doctors are being taught to prescribe it because there is a study where it reduces heart attacks. Of course, at what expense, right? So, uh, I, My type one daughter, she's 37 years old. She was diagnosed at age three has successfully caught, been in nutritional ketosis for almost three years until she popped in her new cannula for her insulin pump. It kinked, it didn't load correctly. And if the insulin pump didn't pick up, it wasn't actually going in. And she did go into a ketoacidotic state and had to be um, hospitalized in ICU. But that was in the absence of insulin. Right. What she was her, only has exogenous. What was her blood sugar? When she, was uh, when she was admitted, it was like 780. And, but but so, so it has to be, uh, ketoacidosis has to be elevation in ketones with the absence of insulin. So that that was what triggered her personally. And I think for those people that are type 2 diabetic, unless you've gone into truly being that adult onset type 1, it's, it's too much insulin is their problem. And so you're not going to run into that. But that's my opinion and that's just my experience. And this category of drugs are the ones you see advertised on TV all the time now. Every five they are minutes. Always. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and I was recently reading an article that um, this category of drug can cause that type of gangrene at any stage you're taking it. It's not just when you first start the drug. It could be eight months down the road. You were seemingly fine, and then you're not. So another reason why get off as many drugs as you can for diabetes and do more carpita. Oh, wait, there's a 70% mortality rate with trunkal neck fascia, necrotizing fasciitis, more days can't great. 70% of them. Cindy said that in this kind of gangrene, necrotizing fasciitis, you know, we've heard of that on people getting it, you That's know, in other body parts. Yeah, but 70% fatality rate from that. So there's not one, if you really get it, your chances of being able to be treated are not very good. What are the main, the trade names of these drugs? In there's in, Jordians. In Volcana. In Volcana. And there's uh, one that's less common. Parsley. 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 Yeah. And there's one more. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it. It, it's one of those advertisements where they talk about, oh, you, do you know you can still get heart disease with diabetes? And most of them sit there and say, oh no, I'm on a set. And this drug, this drug has been shown to decrease your risk of a heart attack, but you might get something else that'll kill you first. Death is still deadly regardless of the... <laughs> Death is always deadly. Yes, ma'am. So I personally think it's going to take rooms full of people just like this, saturating their friends and loved ones, and not, not in an annoying way, right, but in a loving, gentle, waiting until they're ready to hear way. And so when the masses all know this, at some point, uh, it's kind of like the preacher preaching a sermon, and everybody in the congregation knows that he was at the bar last night. <laughs> they're like, okay, whatever. Okay, but it'll just become at some point like the emperor has no clothes, It'll just become ridiculous for them to con continue to say this stuff. Now, Nina Teicholz is working with the Nutrition Coalition, is that right? Mm -hmm. And they're trying to change the guidelines from the top. And I wish them the best of luck, all the hopes and prayers, but I, don't, I, I personally don't think they'll get to first base with that strategy. This has to be grassroots. This has to be you guys. And we just can't stop until we won. The ADA gave a nod to look. Yeah, ADA's already backed off. They're taking pictures of the whole grain pancakes with the glass of orange juice. Those kind of pictures are disappearing from their website. They now offer a, now low carb is standard of care for type two diabetic. It's in the guidelines. That's a huge step, but you notice, I missed the uh, press release in the news conference. <laughs> was there not a news conference about it? It just kind of was like, oh yeah, we've done that. And that's what you can, I, I predict, you can expect to see that sort of thing. They're just going to step away, like, ah, and, oh, we've had this in the guidelines for years. What are you talking about? That's kind of what's going to happen. I think. Anything? Yes, sir. I just comment and say, in a hospital practice, I can tell you that things are changing quite a bit. Uh, it used to be, you know, 
computer entry thing, you would order an 88 diet, and you only knew maybe 2,200 calories or maybe 1,800 calories. Now, even the dietitians are saying, okay, when we're ordering a diabetic diet at the computer, it's called a 60 gram carbohydrate controlled diet. So yep. I think there's more movement than people might realize actually. 60 is maybe too much for diabetic. I'm not going to speak yeah, but it's 60 per meal. Per meal. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, it's a start. That's a good baby step. Yeah. yeah. Is there any way you can add an entry? <coughs> just asking, you could just add a, another diet option into the EMR? Could you do that? You can type it in and you can then go to battle with the dietitian. Yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. 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 So I look to, when I when think keto in a hospital, I think of Mark Kukazella, yes. who was in West Virginia, and he created a hospital program and there's actually a guideline for hospital low-carb nutrition that he helped put together. And that's available. Email me if you can't find it on the internet. Uh, Mark Kukuzela and Adele Height, uh, H-I-T-E, uh, put that together. It's a great document. There's another clinical guideline that just came out from Low Carb USA, which again is Adele Height and then the Low Carb USA team, which gives a guideline for people to follow if, if you need one. Uh, and so in the medical world, this is helpful because everyone wants to follow a guideline and it gets a new, gives a new one for us to follow. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I have a question um, about metformin. Um, that I believe that, you know, fewer medications the better. Mm -hmm. uh, internists believe everybody should be on metformin. Mm -hmm. I don't know now. So metformin, good, bad, do I need it, should I take it? Etc. So I agree with you 100%. I would love for you to be off all medications. Mm -hmm. But of all the medications that you could be taking for type 2 diabetes, the least defensive one to me is metformin. Uh, it, it, metformin sort of mimics what the ketogenic diet does in the body. And so, yeah, that's okay. And some people may need that as their kind of their last medication for another three months, six months, year, depending on the individual situation. But I'm not offended by metformin, and, and I'll tell many people, they're like, I want to stop that too. I'm like, we will, but it's not time yet. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I think in the standard medical circles, this got started with something called the diabetes prevention trial. And they looked at lifestyle adjustment in a pre-diabetic complicated, or a group of people with pre-diabetes, and then they looked at a group of people who had lifestyle education, which basically walked 30 minutes, five days a week, and then up it to 45 minutes, and probably 7% of your body weight through caloric restriction. And then they compared it to a group of people on metformin, and the people with lifestyle change reduced their risk of going on to type 2 diabetes, in this case, by 58% with lifestyle change. Now, the metformin group reduced it 31%. And for some reason, it's so much easier to just skip the lifestyle and jump straight to metformin. So I'm not offended by metformin, but the reality is some people shouldn't be on it. And that is if you have kid chronic kidney disease above a certain point because it increases your risk of lactic acidosis. And the other thing is sometimes people can't tolerate it because of GI side effects. And that's a real thing. Yeah, so a lot of my patients are happy because I take them off medicines that are causing side effects. And so I'll ask, do you have nausea, episodic diarrhea? Well, yeah, but, but and they never put two and two together that it was from metformin. Right. So, and even some people have been on, in my experience, metformin for a long time, no side effects. They keto adapt, and then they start getting nausea or diarrhea. So it's kind of a marker for me if someone starts on a keto diet and they have diarrhea or nausea, I think of metformin as the cause. I think of sugar alcohols as the cause of something else, you know, 
coconut oil, MCT, something that you know isn't really part of my program. But but uh, so metformin rarely can cause lactic acidosis. I think I've maybe seen it once in 20 years. I mean, it's, it's uncommon, but so it's not totally the number. Not totally. Yeah, never saw it. Question. Over on this side of the room, any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about medications for hypertension as well as cholesterol. Um, just like to know your recommendations as to how would you come off of that medication, especially if you don't have a keto-friendly doctor? <laughs> so the recommendation for the cholesterol medications is to throw them in the damn garbage. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to beat around the bush. <laughs> but now, the, the blood pressure medication is, is a more complicated issue. That's something that you'll do with your doctor. Uh, and let me tell you, doctors, the average doctor is very uh, hesitant to stop medications. If they started them, or definitely if a specialist started them, they're very hesitant to stop those. And so you're going to have to provide evidence. And so a great way to do this is, been keto, you've lost some fat, you're feeling better, and you feel like you just don't need that medication anymore, get a blood pressure cuff. And twice a day when you're calm, chill, relaxed, check your blood pressure, write it down. Take those numbers with you to your doctor's appointment and say, look how beautiful these are. Can we decrease this or maybe stop it or can we try? And this is something, this is a good one. Doctors love this. Can I try a trial, a two-week trial? <laughs> of not taking it. And, and you see that I'm dedicated. I'm going to check my blood pressure. If it starts to go back up, I'll come back in immediately. But as long as it stays beautiful like this, eh, right? And most doctors, if they're rational and reasonable, say, yeah, yeah, okay, let's do that. Let's try a trial of that, right? But if you just go in and demand to stop it and you don't have, you don't have your numbers and you don't know what it averages at home, that probably won't go well. First of all, the evidence for people taking statins is, is um, a lot of pie in the sky, especially for women. There has never been any study that showed that it decreases mortality in women. And yet I've seen doctors want to put 80-year-old women because their total cholesterol is 220. Um, so I would never take a statin, ever. I'm more interested in the other values my HDL, my triglycerides, inflammatory markers, losing body fat, blood pressure. Um, do you want to increase another risk for possibly type 2 diabetes? What about your memory? What about people getting all the muscle aches and pains? And many doctors will, will not accept the fact that they believe that a statin will cause the muscle pain. Um, and people, people stop it on their own simply because they find out they feel better when they're off of it. The other issue about blood pressure is, yes, we, uh, I personally don't feel that a patient should be put on blood pressure medicine and their doctor should be, should be sending them home with a prescription for a blood pressure cuff and making sure they know how to use it. Um, and when you're going to do low carb keto and you're going to start losing body fat at some stage, you may very well be feeling really wonderful, your energy's good, and if you're not checking your pressure to know that your top number is dropping from where it used to be, you can also start being very fatigued. You can start getting lightheaded. You can be tired going up steps. Getting out of a chair, you feel kind of a little dizzy. Those are signs, too, that you're over-medicated and you're now overdosed for your, with your blood pressure. <coughs> Plus, a lot of blood pressure medic medications have a lot of side effects. And if you're on diuretics, you could be losing potassium. You could be losing magnesium. And a lot of times magnesium isn't supplemented, and yet when you have enough magnesium, your blood vessels are more relaxed. You're less likely to have so much tension in your blood vessels. So sometimes the, your treatment can actually interfere with what you're trying to fix with the drug. So, but, but I think patients have to be responsible enough to want to take their blood pressure. I talked to a lady at Heal because she was on blood pressure medication. I wanted to find out if she monitored her blood pressure. She said no. I said, do you have a cuff? She said, no. I said, well, could you get one? And she said, I don't want to do that. So um, that may happen. But for people who are motivated and want to partner with their practitioner, that's very important. You're going to get much better results that way. As far 
far as cholesterol medicine, I agree with Ken. Uh, the studies in terms of side effects, if you had a side effect, you were kicked out of the study. So when the drug company reported the side effect rate, it's, it's artificially suppressed. The thing about blood pressure medicine is I agree with everything everybody said. The first thing I try to limit or reduce or get rid of is the diuretics because the ketogenic diet, the keto diet, one of its effects is it mimics a diuretic. It, dump, it allows, with the lower insulin, your kidneys act, you dump salt and water and other electrolytes. And so that is the one, and I'm pretty aggressive about reducing. If you're normotensive and you're starting a ketogenic diet, I'm gonna cut it in half if you're 25, 50 milligrams. If you're on 12 and a half, I'll just stop it. And ask them to monitor their blood pressure. <laughs> and if you're on a thiazide diuretic, that can actually raise your blood sugar in some yes. people. And so and you can actually, they actually, you can think that your diabetes is not doing as well as it is, or as well as it actually is because you're falsely elevating it with a thiazide diuretic. Did you have something? Okay. This side. Debbie? What about if you had a heart attack instead? Gotcha. So then it becomes a little dicey. Repeat the question. Mm -hmm. Nobody heard it over here. Uh, what if you've had a heart attack in the past? Then should you take a statin drug, a cholesterol-lowering medication? <laughs> I still say no. I'm not, I don't find anything compelling in the research. Um, I, Dr. David Diamond is a PhD researcher at the University of South Florida. He has excellent videos about that on YouTube. Uh, obviously, that's something you're going to discuss with your doctor. The discussion may not go well, and that's okay. But it still needs to be a discussion that is had. Uh, but I'm, I, if someone wants to stop their statin and they've had a heart attack in the past, I'm like, there's the garbage right there. Throw it away because your diet is going to trump any minor benefit you might have gotten from that statin. Yeah, I think it's important to realize the keto diet works in a different way than the statin. You may have never heard this before, but we've been saying it the whole time. Triglyceride and HDL, abdominal circumference, blood pressure, blood sugar. This is called the metabolic syndrome. It goes way back, one of my teachers, Professor Gerald Reven at Stanford, called it Syndrome X. And he wrote a popular book and got in trouble for writing a popular book when the medical establishment wouldn't listen. At that same time, the LDL receptor was cloned at the university in Texas, that go nameless. And a Brazilian, I think that's a scientific term, Brazilian yeah, amount of dollars now made from that uh, discovery of LDL receptor and statin drugs like that. All along, Professor Reven was saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, what about metabolic syndrome, syndrome X? Jeff Volick entered the scene 2002 until today, now at Ohio State has nailed metabolic syndrome in paper after paper after paper. So we treat cardiometabolic risk by treating the triglyceride and HDL, not the LDL. And most doctors are not taught this. Uh, that's why we have new organizations teaching people this. That's why you come to conferences and, and learn this. And I have to say, in 13 years in my clinical practice at Duke University, the only time another doctor sent me a nasty email was when I took away a statin drug. So, so we're, I'm bordering you know, mainstream, you know, not mainstream, and I'm still in that world. But you know, that was just one time in thousands of uh, patients and interactions. And it turns out the patient was so intimidated by this cardiologist, she didn't dare even mention it. And, and I thought, well, okay, if we do it for three months, do a test, a trial, a trial off the medicine. Don't say you're taking it away. It's a smoother it a trial. trial. <laughs> Problem is, I took her off the, the permitted trial. She didn't take it in her. Why do people even take pills if they feel like they adopt her? Anyway, because their doctor told them to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got a long yeah. white coat. I'm, I'm an advisor. I, you know, anyway. So she goes and sees the other cardiologist yeah. while she's off the staff. And um, so I get this nasty, how can you take a person off the statin drug? So um, not to worry about the heart attacks, all the, the recurrent heart attacks, although in my area, in every part of the country is different, it's still common practice to have someone on a statin if they've had a heart attack. Doesn't matter if they're male or female, it's just, that's just what doctors do. Yep. And so that's a, an area where I, you know, 
I let the doctor who prescribed your statin talk to your doctor, whoever prescribed it, and and then that's how I do it now. I don't take it away, but I'm gonna. Most of my other patients have other doctors within the, the Duke system, and they're all looking in, and you know. So that's the politics of it. Right. I understand. Yeah. But I'll tell you, as a practicing physician in my area of the country, and everybody in this room, you guys know what metabolic syndrome is. Yeah. Okay. That makes you smarter than the average doctor. Because I have seen doctors fight tooth and nail for the statin and completely ignore their A1C. It's, it's only 5.9. I mean, that's not bad. And ignore the slightly elevated triglycerides, the slightly low HDL, and obviously the midsection that does not measure what it should. They won't even mention that in their note. They won't even mention it to the patient. But by God, you better take that statin. And that's the current standard of care in many, many medical communities around the world. <clears throat> so I also practice in a big, actually a private hospital system. Uh, they now 11 hospitals, 2,500 doctors in the, <clears throat> in the clinic in Piedmont. And so I'm dealing with that same thing. You know, the original, how I deal with it is I usually have people who are having side effects and I'll have them come off as a trial. And that flies usually a little better if you tell them you're stopping it for a period of time because of side effects and their A1C gets better and their you know restless legs, nocturnal leg pain goes away. Uh, that does pretty well. But you know the original Framingham data said that the highest risk group were people with high triglycerides and low HDL. But you don't have a pill for that. But the keto diet is excellent at dealing with that. Um, those people have higher risk than the people with a slightly high LDL. Exactly. Yes, sir, back to the room. Okay, so can you talk about how you guys balance the desire to operate in a manner that allows you to keep your license and the desire <laughs> to actually help somebody? Do you have to say to your patients, you know, I'd like to see you eat this way, but you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very good question. How do, how do doctors balance knowing what we know, but then also having to practice within a big private hospital system or a big public hospital system and the potential feedback from colleagues or the medical board? And I'll just tell you, some doctors are much more comfortable playing outside their sandbox than other doctors. Some docs just won't touch it. Uh, and so if, if, if there ever was an instance where I felt uncomfortable for whatever social or, or professional reason, I would use ninja tactics and I would help the patient, I would help them to decide for themselves that they were going to stop that step. And I've just done that Jedi mind trick, Scott. many <laughs> times. Yeah, just Jedi <laughs> mind trick and be like, well, have you ever, and like, oh, my legs hurt at night, right? And I'm like, well, have you ever tried skipping the Zocor for a few nights and just see what happens? Because if the Zocor is causing that leg pain, that can't be good, right? <laughs> and then they get home and they stop it and the leg pain goes away and they're like that can't be good right <laughs> and then they make their own decision to stop that damn step I guess you haven't watched any of my videos <laughs> I publicly do this and the doctor the floor under me doesn't know what I do. And so there, there are silos of information where it's very, it's so I go to conferences and talk to other doctors, do this, no one's ever been sued, the license has never been taken away and given a keto diet. Show me, send it to me, it's never been taken away. Now in other countries where they don't have freedom of speech, they don't have the, the same uh, American, uh, uh, values system illegally the, a couple doctors have had threatening of their licenses and all that and they got wrangled and one of them's actually speaking around the world now Tim Noakes yes. from yeah. Cape Town and so these are these are the doctors who actually neither of them really were in obesity medicine in a in a, a group that actually is solid and, and they were called out one by doing a tweet one by telling someone not to eat sugar because he got tired of lopping off the amputate, doing amputations for diabetic foot ulcers, an orthopedic surgeon, that's Gary Fethke in Australia. There's no US physician 
or even Canadian physician, Evelyn bourdois Ra, who I just saw in Denver. She got up and told her story. She was brought in front of a professional standards board. She prevented, presented the evidence. They said, oh, okay, go ahead and do it. But the fact that she was brought in front of the board still, it, this is not a scientific term, um, it sucks. It, it, it's unacceptable. <laughs> I mean, but, so I spoke, Evelyn is in front of me in Denver just a few months ago, and you know, she said, you know, Eric, it's so good to hear you speak and say how confident you are because she just had to go through this. But uh, it's not risky. In fact, you're helping people. And so to, to um, most doctors who come to the Obesity Medicine Association do it because they're fed up with the tools that they have. Their patients are not getting better. And so this is one organization, the OMA, Obesity Medicine Association, where doctors learn how to do this approach with other tools as well. But um, I'm happy to have been part of uh, the training with Jackie and Dr. Atkins. They were not in a university setting, but I've been within Duke University for 30 years, in the last 15, 20 years, doing research and clinical care. And so a lot of people look to our program, Dr. Will Yancey and myself, and by the way, Will was uh, on that American Diabetes Association paper that came out last month endorsing low-carb diets. And he was with me at the Great Nutrition Debate in the year 2000, which really kind of, I think, gave him an eye-opener that this was much more than just science. So the, the guidelines and all this, and, and doctors getting up, just you know, do what's best for your patient. And, uh, there are, uh, oh, Jay Wardman gives a great talk on the herd mentality of professionals, especially doctors. And so they don't want to be outside the herd and all that. But no one has been sued successfully in the U.S. The last time was uh, this guy who was paid by the PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. I even remember his name. It, uh, it should, it should, no, Gorin. Uh, oh, yeah, Michael Gorin. No, well, no, no, no someone. Yeah, someone. Talking about Dr. Joel Furman? Dr. Atkins was, was yeah. sued, but it was frivolous. The doctor um, uh, wrote in the book, you know, do this with your doctor. The judge looked at it and said, this is a frivolous because, you, you know, it's written in the book that you're supposed to follow your doctor, and you did. So anyway, and, and of course, as Mark Twain says, you want to be careful reading a book written by a doctor. Because, well, you don't want to die of a misprint. <laughs> so, you know, there, that balance, so, you know, I, I'm happy to be able to say that I'm out there, I've been out there for a long time, and there are people following and doing it. It's slow, but it's changing. I have to say, I think we're at a tipping point as well. And the tipping point involves businesses, companies doing this, company, you, we have to get the engine. What we're fighting is big business and the, the guidelines. That's why you're so um, um, appropriately skeptical that guidelines will change because the lobbying uh, from businesses uh, is only on one side of it. So, I mean, that's, uh, so don't worry about doing this as a doctor, and you might, but you may have to embolden your, <coughs> embolden your doctor by saying, hey, there's this guy, the crazy guy over at Duke, and I don't know, you know look him up, you know, and all you have to do is, is go on Google for half a second, and you'll find all these things. So. One of the things that drives me is I am so pissed off <laughs> that I was 294 pounds and being hammered with steroids and steroids and steroids and eat less and exercise more. And now that I have found this, I feel like uh, try to stop. Come on. Yeah. And, and the reason is that I've been in medicine for 20, well, since 1983, and people are dying of diabetes, of necrotizing fasciitis, and blindness and kidney disease and dialysis centers on every corner. I mean, what I do is I just follow the keto diet and I teach every patient I see the keto diet and then we adjust it based on certain other factors. And then I show the other doctors the benefits. How many healthcare providers do we have with us? 
professional health care providers or we yes, care not, it non amateur okay. practice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I'm so glad you guys are here. I love asking that question, seeing how many as the numbers continue to grow. Um, in in uh, Seattle, there's a huge percentage of health care providers in the room. It's an amazing question. Yes, ma'am. My doctor's a big believer in using red yeast rice to try to avoid taking statins. Mm. Will you have the same side effects as far as muscle and joint pain and all of that from red yeast rice as you will from Potential. You go, uh, so red yeast rice versus a statin. Uh, her doctor is a big proponent of red yeast rice as a as for lowering total cholesterol. Just a baby and statin. I think it's probably less bad. <laughs> but <laughs> Right. Why, that, that, your doctor is still under the false paradigm that, that elevated cholesterol is bad. And so, I mean, if you want to take red yeast rice, you know, it's fine. But I don't think that's going to decrease your risk of a heart attack or a stroke. And it, that's what we're all after. Will it, give, will it uh, cause the same side effects? Maybe. For some people, I think probably yes. But for most people, the side effect profile is lower, I think. My understanding is that the way that works is primarily because it has a niacin-like effect. Yep. And the way niacin works is it lowers triglycerides and raises HDL, which yep. should be good, right? Um, unfortunately, we have two very big trials that showed no benefit in terms of event rate for mortality. And so largely, the cardiologists have abandoned niacin as a therapeutic thing. Uh, the main side effect of niacin is flushing, so you'll have a man who turn to be red in the middle of the afternoon uh, or in the middle of the night and they go to the ER thinking they're having a heart attack. Um, and so it's not the myalgias, it's not usually um, some of the other things, but it will raise blood sugar. Yeah. And if a woman gets really hot and red in the middle of the night, she just thinks she's having a hot flash. Right. But if a man has that, oh my God, it's a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Funny little thing there, right? Yes, ma'am. What about gliberide? My husband was on metformin and gliberide, and now he's on the lowest dose of gliberide, but he, you know, his type 2 diabet diabetes is like almost completely gone. Yeah. He's just on that. Can yeah. he, do you he, feel like he can go so ahead? obviously work with your doctor on that, but it's probably time to stop the gliberide. Uh, gliberide works by a completely different mechanism than metformin, and uh, it actually elevates the insulin. That's how it works. That's, I mean, that is known in the medical community. And so that's why we're okay with if he would still be on metformin and be like, yeah, it's no big deal. But the glyburide is actually elevating his insulin level. That's how it works. You know, I've even um, had the experience now where someone with an A1C of 12 or 14, so this is the blood sugars 300, 300, 400 all day long, not be put on any medication. All they do is change the diet. And it's just a matter of time until you have a normal blood sugar. So the metaphor I use is bringing an airplane in for a landing. Uh, you know, when the airplane is on the ground and stopped, that's no diabetes and no weight issue if that was the cause of the diabetes. So you can use blood glucose lower medicine to bring the plane down real fast and then, I mean, so you can, <laughs> you don't want to bounce the plane on the ground, that's bad form. And it's actually risky. So even when you're taking people, so the bariatric surgeons have known this. They, they take people off all of the diabetes medicine immediately. Of course, they're fasting. They're not eating after the surgery. And then they incorporate protein shakes because then you can't have much of it. So we might actually learn from their experience where we want to take people off the medicine sooner than you might think. Because you don't want to risk a low blood sugar. And even the glipizide, glabiride, the sulfonylureas can cause a low blood sugar. And I, recently in my clinic, I'm walking across the street to get lunch, and there's this uh, five mile an hour car going by on a 45 mile an hour road. And she's this older woman is, help me, my blood sugar is low, I don't know where I am. She's in a car. <laughs> wow. and, and so she, she no, was enough to yell out at me, and so basically she was having a low blood sugar, still driving her car, and uh, it's kind of how can I plan this? I, I look and I say, you know, go, I say, put your foot on the brake, and I put her uh, a stick on the tree, you know, put it in park, and it, I said, where's do you have some sugar? Do you have? Some, I don't know. My blood sugar's low. I don't know where I am. I mean, you know, this is what happens when your blood sugar is that low, and medicine makes it go low. You won't have it this low if you're not on medicine. 
So I look around in the front, on the floor, and there's a bag from the convenience store. I look, there's an Atkins bar. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it's enough sugar. (laughs) (laughs) Now the shakes are truly low in total, but not the bars. The bars are crap. (laughs) And so she starts munching on this. A police officer comes up, says, "I think she had a little blood sugar. She'll be fine." And then I go get lunch. (laughs) Was it an Atkins bar? It was an Atkins bar. So back, back for you? To your husband. Oh, no, no, no. Now that you know that the glyburide can raise his insulin, and also there's a risk of hypoglycemia, that can't be good, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I mean, I really like my, my doctor. It's really proud to say delivered me. But her default is, is um, she doesn't really know anything about low carb. But that leaves me on my own with doing all my own research, trying to figure out what tests I need. You know, she, it doesn't really make that connection. In that kind of situation, would you recommend um, finding a doctor that, that understands more about this lifestyle and what, and what this can do for you and to you? So if the doctor you currently have that has no clue about low carb, should you maybe change your doctor? And that's, that's a very valid question. And this puts you in a particular position where what's going on with you is not your fault, but it's very much your problem, right? And so definitely keep doing your research and then you've got to find a doc, at least if nothing else for an occasional consult to help you uh, to, so you can bounce questions off them. A doctor who knows about low carb, I think that's vital for you. This is one of those times where as the patient, you might influence the doctor. Um, there are lots of patients who, because of their own success, if your doctor is at least willing to, you know, I'm a lifelong learner. I've never learned more in a short period of time than the last six years. So there's the opportunity, but some are not gonna bite because they've got the degree, you know, they've got the white coat, and, you know, they're not gonna listen, and that's the person where I would at least consult somebody who knows about low carb. Um, but, you know, one of the things is, you know, with the internet, um, for instance, there's a video uh, from Asim Malatra who talks about stents and statins, do they work? You know, they might be willing to listen to that. Or, you know, you can, you know, a lot of times, even in my own family, they won't listen. But they might watch a movie, you know. And so there are a lot of ways that you can introduce the subject. Always keep an eye out at dietdoctor.com. If you're first timers here, <coughs> don't know about it. It's based out of Sweden. Andreas Ienfeldt has been on this cruise before with his camera cruise. Um, and um, they have a new site for doctors at dietdoctor.com. Just rolled out in the last month or so where you can actually go and learn how to de prescribe and all this stuff. And they're doing their best to at least get the information out there. We have Adapt Your Life videos. That it, that there's a YouTube channel called Adapt Your Life, and I've done lots of the videos there. They're short, five minutes or less, and kind of handles a lot of these questions. And Ken's videos, um, we're just trying to get information out anyway. Maybe don't show my videos. <laughs> well, uh, have you heard, has some doctor been offended by your videos? Perhaps. <laughs> in the back, the good looking lady agrees. Last question. So what are some good books that you guys recommend, not for a a family member, but for your doctor, for your nurse practitioner, for your PA, for your midwife? What are some good, like, you'd be like, I would listen to that book. That book looks professional. It looks doctory enough. I would listen to that. One of the biggest ones that I recommend is The Big Fat Surprise. Yeah. 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 That is fantastic because it is very scientific, it's very well researched, and it tells the story of this failed fat diet called a low fat diet. Um, good calories, bad calories is also great. Lies my doctor told me is good. Um, I tell them all of those. Um, keto Clarity, somebody, uh, real food keto. Uh, the obesity code is one of them. The art and science of low carbohydrate living. 
Yeah, and the art and science of low car performance. Well, you've already covered most of the ones that I want. The only concern I have about doctors when they see the size of some of those books, um, I don't know that they really have the time to deal with that. So, so um, I think going to dietdoctor.com where things are, are on the internet, they can do it at their own pace, um, there's information for them. Um, I think that may be a, a more palatable, digestible start for them. And then if they really want to get the dirt on how we got into the mess with them, then good calories, bad calories, be his book are good ones to go to. Yeah. There's also a really good textbook out there on metabolic dietary therapies, and, and it is a big text and it is really expensive, but if you're looking to drive your doctor toward evidence-based <coughs> research, it's nice because it has everything packaged into one. So it's got the type 2 diabetes, epilepsy, Alzheimer's, all of the sort of metabolic impact areas that ketogenic diets can have in one textbook with the research linked. So if you've really got somebody who's, you know, banging away for the evidence, that might be something they Yeah, so ketogenic therapies, Susino is the editor of it. I have a, uh, I have a chapter in there. But the best <laughs> diabetes book ever written is called Diabetes, Dr. Atkins' Diabetes Revolution, written by Jackie Everstein. <laughs> <laughs> Way ahead of way ahead of its, way ahead of its time, um, and um, of course, Keto Clarity has been an introduction for many end users. I don't know how many doctors enter this space by Keto Clarity, but Jimmy, bunch of them. A lot of doctors Keto Clarity, and then the new Atkins for a new you is one that Westman, Finney, and Volick we uh, did now ten years ago, and that I think is the best book on nutrition. It's not because of me; it's because Finney and Volick wrote the chapters on protein and fat. And one of the chapters is called Fat is Your Friend. So that's called The New Atkins for a New You. The only kind of misstep in that book is that it really rolled out net carbs right. as the major um, force. And it's kind of like over, -counter, over the counter medicine. It's not that net carbs can't work. And, and this is where we get into you know, internal echo chamber debates. You know, do you do total carbs or net carbs? So we were all taught total carbs as the way to do it. So you're not risking fiber being absorbed or, or sugar alcohols affecting ketones, things like that. So um, the new Atkins for a 